What happened in 9-11 is we didn't have a strategy, we didn't have bipartisan agreement, we didn't have American understanding of it, and we had instead a policy coup in this country, a coup, a policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11. I couldn't stay away from Mother Army. I went back there to see Don Rumsfeld. I'd worked for him as a White House fellow in the 1970s. All this is in the book. And, um, and I said, am I doing okay on CNN? He said, yeah, 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 fine. He said, uh, I'm thinking about it. He says, I read your book. And uh, he said, uh, this is a book that talks about the Kosovo campaign. And he said, I just want to tell you, he said, nobody's going to tell us where or when we can bomb. Nobody. He said, I'm thinking of calling this a floating coalition. What do you think about that? I said, well, sir, uh, thanks for reading my book. And, uh, well, uh, he said, thanks. That's all the time I've got. Really? And um, I went downstairs. I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. He said, but um, I guess it's, they don't know what to do about terrorism. And so uh, the, it, they, they think, but they can attack states and they want to look strong. And so I guess they think if they take down a state, it will intimidate the terrorists. And, you know, it's like that old saying he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. Well, I walked out of there pretty upset. And then um, we attacked Afghanistan. I was pretty happy about that. We should have. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I seven, seven countries in five years. I, I, I sat on this information for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. Talk about the PNAC, Doc. The so, PNAC so being the, Project, project the, for New American the, Century. The, PNAC. Pro, the Project for the New American Century, which is a think tank that was around uh, in the late ni in the 90s uh, and up through 2005 or 6, uh, and then it disappeared and then what came back online in 2009 when the coast was clear and clearly nobody was getting prosecuted for anything. A and there are about 17 members of this so-called think tank who were in top positions in the Bush-Cheney administration, advisor to the president, to the vice president, assistant secretary of defense, and so forth. Uh, and, and a couple of these guys, Fife and, uh, and Wolfowitz, uh, ha had earlier worked for Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel and put out a paper that advocated the same kind of program that they then put out papers from PNAC advocating, that is intense nationalism and militarism and going after uh, Middle Eastern states with aggressive wars. Uh, and, and this is what PNAC urged on President Bill Clinton, who agreed with them and made regime change in Iraq one of his goals. And, and I think this is very significant, that this PNAC document, although it was mostly Republicans, I believe Lieberman was a supporter of it, if not a signer of it. But, it, but Clinton agreed with one of its main propositions, that th there are certainly sections of the Democratic Party that are on board with this vision. Right, and, and they, there are several key papers that they published, and the biggest one maybe was in 2000 called Rebuilding America's Defenses, as if, as if they needed to somehow be rebuilt, uh, which was advocating uh, a, a much larger military. President Trump using the most advanced warship ever built to showcase America as the world's number one military superpower. This carrier and the new ships in the Ford class will expand the ability of our nation to carry out vital missions on the oceans to project American power in distant lands. Hopefully it's power we don't have to use, but if we do, they're in big, big trouble. We're also putting in a massive budget request
for our beloved military. And we will be substantially upgrading all of our military, all of our military, offensive, defensive, everything, bigger and better and stronger than ever before, and hopefully we'll never have to use it, but nobody's going to mess with us, folks. No better. It will be one of the greatest military buildups in American history. The ability to fight multiple simultaneous wars, uh, an aggressive agenda of going after nations in key regions of, of American interest, uh, including resource regions, the need to plunder other people's resources. And a lot of it is, is language about absolute dominance and maintaining control of the world and, and fending off any possible rival. This is in the shadows of the Cold War having ended and the need existing for some new enemy and they haven't quite come up with international terrorism or Al-Qaeda yet to fill that gap, uh, but they want to take this opportunity to maintain American dominance. And get rid of regimes that have gone like this. So you can't have any way that have left the U.S. sphere of influence. So Saddam in, uh, in Iraq, but you also then have Iran, and it's a series of Syria. And see, so you have to either be in our sphere of influence or you're not going to be. Right, and, and you look at what Wesley Clark said about the list of nations that Donald Rumsfeld had, seven nations we were going to go into in five years if, if the Iraqi people hadn't fought back, I guess. No, I think, I think it's very important that, that, that this issue of the, there's a significant section of the Democratic Party leadership either shares this vision or is, does not abhor it. For example, while Lieberman supported this document, and Lieberman gets chosen as Al Gore's vice president. So there's a whole section here that, that, that are they're more or less on the same page. Well, there are a lot of factors in that uh, pick, I think. Maybe the biggest being Al Gore's pretense that he had never met Bill Clinton and was buddies with one of Clinton's attackers. But, but I agree that the Democratic Party is, does not have a vision that is dramatically different uh, from this. So uh, how about President Obama? He runs in the campaign promising a new mindset on foreign policy. Do you see any indication that, that Obama has a, a fundamentally different view of, than the PNAC document? Yeah, he talked in the campaign, at least on occasion, about ending the mindset that allows war. Then he gave, went and gave a Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech glorifying war and maintaining that Martin Luther King Jr. had been wrong in his Peace Prize acceptance speech, which if a Republican had done it, we'd still be hearing the outrage. And this is someone who gave an Oval Office speech a couple of months back where he regurgitated all of the lies that Bush had told about these wars, about Iraq, starting back with the weapons of mass destruction on through the lies about the surge that are being used to justify the continuation and escalation in Afghanistan. So there is a problem with the Democrats buying in to the same lies that you get from the Republicans. Uh My fellow Americans, as President and Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. Congress gave us this authority in August 1964 to do whatever may be necessary. That's pretty far-reaching. That's the sky's the limit. At the time, I referred to it as another sinking of the main. Suggesting? Well, you know what the best historical advice is in regard to the sinking of the main. It was a deliberate act on the part of the United States to have an excuse to go to war against Spain. The Gulf of Tonkin was in a deliberate, aggressive act on the part of the Johnson administration to justify making war against North Vietnam. Three weeks after the Tonkin incident, the Maddox put into Subic Bay in the Philippines. Investigators from the Pentagon came aboard and interrogated most of the crew. Testimony only of those who thought they had seen enemy action was later presented to the Fulbright Committee. No testimony from those who thought nothing was there. Former Senator Wayne Morse. Well, don't pay any attention to what the military says after the fact to make a case before the fact. Uh, if you rely upon the American military uh, for credibility, uh, then you're easy prey. Uh, 
Um, it, I'm very interested in, in the questions you're asking about whether this is a, some sort of a hoax. Let me ask again. We were told a year ago that the sarin gas attack in Syria was committed by regime forces, by Assad's regime. We learned two months ago that we don't really know that, that we were lied to about that. I would think as a U.S. senator, you would have an interest in getting to the truth I, because I the truth matters, I, doesn't I it? I think it's perfectly fine for someone uh, in a position like you to ask that question. Uh, I'm Why aren't you asking the question? I'm, I'm convinced. Well, I, I've... Uh, I've been listening to a lot over the last year, and for my purposes, I'm convinced that Bashar Assad was very much involved in the attack a year ago. Uh, the United Nations Security what makes Council you think is that? currently, based on information I've heard, I think the United well, can you, Nations can you Security characterize Council it for us because the Secretary of Defense? That. I'm sorry, I wouldn't. I wouldn't typically inter interrupt you, but you suggested that I was somehow allied with Putin. So I, I think I, I can press you on this question. I'm, I'm the Secretary of that Defense you asked the same question that he asked, and that's, that's oh, fair. so I must be a Russian agent. I get it. Right? I'm yeah, not saying fair. that at um, all. I'm not right. saying that because it's a very obvious question, yeah. actually. And the Secretary of Defense said two months ago that we didn't have proof, but you apparently have proof that the Secretary of Defense doesn't have. Could you characterize it for us? No. Completed military, avoid needless foreign wars, build new friendships overseas, and remember those three famous words, peace through strength. Yeah.